All right, we are almost done with our talented ball character. Geometry is now in place. Custom shader is in place. And for those of you that might be completely new to 3D, you may be thinking to yourself, well, this guy is ready to go. Let's take him out for a spin. Let's animate him hopping along. That's fine, but let's think back to the storyboards. What does this guy need to be able to do while in motion? He needs to be able to squash and stretch and bend forwards and backwards so that it'll look as if he's throwing his weight forwards in each of the bounces as he works his way towards the ladder. When he climbs up and he jumps off the diving board, he needs to flip end over end as he falls down towards the bottom of the pool. So how do we go about doing this? Well, the squashing and stretching, while difficult, I'd say it's possible to do up at the object level with uh, uh, some slick manipulation of our pivot point and then scales. But it would be difficult to make look right without getting into some expressions because with squashing and stretching, it's not just scaling. It's we're maintaining volume. You've got to give the sense of volume being maintained. And uh, the bending... Now, that's going to be a nightmare to accomplish from at the object level. We're going to need to do some sort of deformation to our geometry down at the SOPS level. So we need a rig to make life easy for our, our animator. So what exactly is a rig? Let's jump over here to the whiteboard. A rig. A rig is nothing more than some custom-defined controls that makes animation easy. It's the bottom line. Uh, let's think of a, a puppet. You know those puppets that have their arms and legs attached to strings? Yeah. You could say that here's our rig. Our rig is the fact that we have these two cross sticks, and then we have our strings that come down that tie up to our character. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and we can use that to control him. But this makes life a lot easier than just simply taking our character in the real world and handing it to someone who's going to bring it to, to life yeah. and say, all right, move the arms and legs. It's the, uh, it's the interface between our character and the animator. Ooh. So the, the animator has control over this high-level interface, and that interface is then going to do all of the complicated technical work under the hood because an animator doesn't want to worry about that. He doesn't, no. want to, he doesn't want to have to scale our character. He just wants a squash and stretch slider. And rigs can be... Anything from something very simple to, to extremely complex rigs. I mean, what if we had a piston, right? And we could tell an animator that, all right, well, you need to go down and grab this part to have the piston compress and retract, etc. Or we could just make a slider, and then the animator can just drag it between a value of 0 and 1, and as the animator does then the piston is going to do its thing. A very simple rig. You have a very complex rig where you have one of the Transformers robots <laughs> that has <laughs> tons of pieces that need to move in various ways, and you could have a simple slider, once again, from zero to one. This is your transform slider. And then you could have stuff like you know, a character with a face that has a whole bunch of blend shapes all set up. So you have an interface that allows you to add a little bit of left, you know, left eye closed, a little bit of right eyebrow up, and a bit of a sneer and let's flare the nostrils a bit again without this interface as steve described it an artist would have to go in and work with all of the elements at a lower level and this would be very difficult to animate so the idea of a rig is once again to provide i really like that whole interfacing that's very slick cool. it's just to provide a convenient interface that makes animating the object or objects easy and so we need some sort of interface for our character so that when Steve begins animating him, it's very easy to do the squashing and the stretching. We don't want to think about scaling and, and maintaining volume and then, you know, bending forwards and backwards. And we need to make sure we're bending forwards and backwards from the right location because here we are with a stretched out sphere. The stretched out sphere could be bent backwards, and notice we're bending more from the bottom point right here, as you don't see much of the bend effect here, but as we go up, we start to see a lot more of the effect. Well, the bend, what if it occurred from right there? So now you're left with something that looks more, well, not quite like that, but something along these lines where the effect is coming from the center. So all of this can be worked out in the rig so that an animator doesn't have to think about any of this when they begin the actual animation process. The final thing that we're going to need to worry about and it's what's going to make this rig a bit special, is that the character needs to have the ability to be rotated around its center axes in Z 
no matter how squashed, stretched, or bent he is. So at any given time, we must be able to know the true center of our geometry, no matter how deformed he is. So how are we going to set this up? It's actually quite simple. Let's go ahead and clear everything off. At this point, Steve has his sphere. And then he has his texture and material nodes. So I'm just going to put matte. Cool. That's going to represent that whole little idea of the two nodes that are controlling a material being applied to them. We're going to create our rig after our material. The reason is we need to have the material properly applied to the geometry in a non-deformed manner. And then with the material applied, we can deform the geometry and the material will be deformed properly. So it's very important that the rig gets created after the material has been assigned, or mainly after the, oh, the, so the after UVs have been, created. Have been yeah. created. That's that's the big thing. But we will come in here after material. Now, basically, at this point, we can just bring in two twist nodes. A twist node allows us to select various operations. Is the twist going to be a squash and stretch? Is it going to be a bend? Is it going to be a twist, etc.? Yeah, it gives us just a list of different deformations that, that we, we can, can choose, choose to apply to our geometry. So in our case, the first one will be the squash and stretch, while the second one is going to be the bend. Okay, that's good. Now we need to worry about that center point of the character. And that's where things are going to get interesting. How do we calculate? So here we are with our sphere, center point. Here we are with a squashed sphere, center point. Here we are with a bent sphere that has been stretched, center point. We need to make sure we always have the center point so that we are rotating properly. Yeah, because okay. if we were to wire the bend just into a transform stop, we then have to calculate that pivot point, And that's kind of hard to do. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a point to our geometry that is always going to be in the center. And then for our transformation for rotation, we're simply going to say we're going to make its pivot point at the location of this point. So in essence, we're going to add a point into the geometry, and then at the very end of this network, we're going to take the point back out. But we're still going to be able to reference where that point was. If we add the point before we do any of the deformation, that point will get deformed as well. That meaning that point's going to be moved, and that point will be in the correct location. It'll always be in the center of our geometry. Exactly. So we don't have to worry about doing the hard work of calculating exactly how the squash and stretch and bend are affecting our geometry. We let Houdini do that. We provide the center point. We let it get deformed as well as our geometry, and then we can simply pull that center point back out afterwards, and we know exactly where the center of our geometry is. Exactly. So... To do this, we're going to use an ADSOP. An ADSOP allows us to go in and just add points into our geometry. So we will create a point that, once again, is at the center of our geometry. Very easy to do. You guys already know how to go about using an expression to calculate the center because we've already got that information. <laughs> now, we're going to take this and we're going to wire that point into a group. Now we're putting the point into a group SOP so that we can always quickly say, give me that point. No matter where we are in the rest of our network, I want to be able to say, give me that point. So that later on, I can say, give me that point. Now delete everything except for that point or delete just the point. And having that group will make doing that a piece of cake. So now we, we have a sphere and we have a point. But these are two separate things. Notice we have two different branches of a network. So we need to bring these two guys together before we do any sort of deformation. So we're going to take these guys, take their outputs, and wire them into a merge. Now all of our geometry has been merged together. From here, we can now wire into the first twist, which will be our squash and stretch. The output of that will just simply turn around and wire into our next twist, which will set the operation to bend. Do not let the operation in there confuse you. Again, these are just twist nodes. Okay? Now, 
Also, the order is kind of important here as well because you want to bend after he's been squashed or stretched. Okay, Otherwise, we could end up with some interesting looking yeah. results. <laughs> Now, after this, so far, hopefully everybody seeing this is pretty easy. We've got a sphere that has had uh, UVs and materials applied, and we've got a point, and that point's in the center of the sphere, and now it's all been merged together. So now when we squash and stretch it, the point is also going to get squashed and stretched. That point's going to move, basically, because there is no real geometry there to deform. He just moves around. So he's always in the center. Now, I want to delete the point back out. So all I need to do... Let's come over here and wire into a delete SOP. And I can tell it, use my group right there so that I can gain access to that one point, and let's remove that point out. Okay, So now, at this point in the network, we're just left with the sphere. Excellent, because in the end, that's all we want to deal with is just the sphere. Now, I can also come out of the bin network and branch off in a different direction, and I can put another delete sop. Once again, using the mighty power of the group to gain quick access to the dot, I can say delete out everything except for that point. So this just leaves us the dot. But keep in mind, this dot is already properly positioned thanks to the deformations that have occurred right there with our twist nodes, okay? So he's already in the right position. He's in the center of our character, no matter how the character has been deformed. So over here, delete all but point. Over here, delete point. Excellent. Only one node left. Now we need to set up a transform node and this transform node is important for only one thing, and that is for giving us the ability to rotate our character around his Z axes so that as he climbs up the ladder, jumps off the diving board, and is going down towards the pool, he's doing these circles, which is the rotation around Z all the way down. And we've gone through great efforts to make sure that we know the center point of him because if we didn't, and if we were rotating around, let's say, down here at the base, it would look very, very awkward. This will look correct. All right, so this transform is being set up for a special rotation. With the transform node, we have access to the pivot point. Where do we want the transformations to occur at? So with that pivot point, all we need to do is reference, so his pivot for X, Y, and Z simply needs to reference the location of this dot. That puts our transform handles at the center of our character, no matter how the character is deformed. Now, if we rotate around the z-axis with this node right here, we have our character rotating properly. So, this is the rig that we're going to set up. It's very simple, very straightforward. You're going to go ahead and... Now, we'll put sliders and all that in, in, in the, the next, next video. video. Yeah. yeah, let's keep it simple to just the creation of this. But let's be able to demonstrate by the end, Steve, have the characters stretched out, bent forwards or backwards, and the fact that he will still rotate at the right spot. So remember, with visibility down here, what are we dealing with? Just our deformed sphere. We're, even though there's, there's no reason for visibility over here, obviously, it's just mm -hmm. a point, but we can make reference to that point, and that is the important thing. So this is what we're going to be setting up. Steve, let's jump over into Houdini real quick. Cool. Let's put this together. Sweet. So Don't Kill that light out. That light's yeah, driving me crazy. Driving me crazy too. <laughs> so I'm going to jump up to object level. I'm going to grab both our point light and our ambient light. And I'm going to push delete to nuke them out. Now we get nice default lighting back. <laughs> so I'm going to jump back inside our character. As we can clearly see now what's, what's going on. Okay. So here we've got our character going through our material. So we said we before we want to create that point in the center so that we can wire these both into a merge. So let's do that first. So let's create an add SOP. And I'm going to bring my visibility down onto the add, but I'm going to template the sphere so we can see the point we're creating in relation mm -hmm. to our sphere. 
And at the point I'm going to create, I want to specify a position. Well, we know the X and Z were centered up on the origin, so that's great. A zero for each is fine. But we need to move from the bottom of the sphere to the center, and we know that this distance is the radius in Y for our sphere. So let's use that for our position in Y. So I'm going to set this to reference our character sphere. It's radius Y parameter. And that's going to move this point to the center of the sphere. And before we go into uh, a merge, I want to group this point so that we can reference it later. So I'm going to wire this into a group. And I'm going to just rename this to group center point. I think I'll actually rename this to add center point. Cool. So on our group, the group name I'll call center point group. The entity, we're going to be grouping points. And I'll leave everything else as default since we've only got the one point and we just want him in, in the group. And using the group, once you have things in the group, they're highlighted yellow. Yep. And you can see right now... There's our point in the center yep. of that highlighted in yellow. Highlighted yellow, so we have the point selected there. Fantastic. So now we can merge these two guys together. So I'm going to right-click on the output of the material and type merge. Push enter to accept that. Enter to drop the merge into the view. And I'm going to left-click on the output of group center point and wire him into the merge as well. And let's just name this to merge sphere and center point. Fantastic. So now we've got, I can untemplate this guy, push W to go into wireframe and bring up points. We've got that point floating there in the center. So now we can wire this guy through our two deformations, apply the squash and stretch and apply the bend and both our sphere geometry and that center point are going to be affected. So I'm going to right click on the output of the merge and I'm going to type twist since we're going to create a twist sop. Push enter to accept that, enter to place that into the scene. And I'm going to rename this guy to squash and stretch. Let's bring our visibility down. So the operation is going to be squash and stretch. And we don't want to squash and stretch on the X axis. We want to squash and stretch on the Y axis. And we can see when we come to set up our sliders and everything, the parameter we're going to be controlling is the strength parameter, which controls. Watch that center point. Notice how it is moving along with the geometry. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Extreme. So, yeah, there's the center point there. And as we squash and stretch, he's moving down mm -hmm. and following with the center, which so is exactly and leave, what we need. Let's leave him stretched out a bit. Cancel that out. So, you, Point seven yeah, five. looks great. Cool. It'll make the bend a lot easier to see. Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to right-click on the output of the squash and stretch. I'm going to grab twist from our history, single left-click on that, and push enter to create another twist. And I'll rename this guy to bend. And then from the operation, I want to grab bend. And the default parameters, they come in are perfect for what we need. So now we can see if we change our strength. Notice how the center point is staying in the center of our geometry which is great because now we've applied our deformations, we've squashed and stretched, and we've bent the sphere, our character. And coming out of here, we can grab this point and know the center point of our geometry. So to do that, I want to branch off into two different branches of the network as seen on the whiteboard, one where we remove this point and one where we remove everything but this point. So I'm going to right-click on the output of the bend and type delete. Push enter to accept that, enter to drop a delete in. And I'm going to rename this to delete center point. And we can come down and the group where well, we're going to be deleting our center point. And since we've grouped that, we can specify that we're going to delete him. I want to make sure that we're deleting points since the group relates to a point. And we're deleting selected, so we'll leave the operation set to that. And we can see if we toggle between these two, on the bend we have the center point. On the delete, that center point has now been removed. Now I'm going to middle click on the output of the bend and wire a new delete. So I'll single left click on delete, single left click to drop him into the uh, network. And I'm going to rename this guy to isolate center point. And on this node, again, we're going to be referring to our center point group, which again is points. But I want to delete everything that's not selected. So we're going to select that center point by specifying it in the group but then delete everything else and keep that center point. So there's a center point there. Excellent. So now we can wire our transform off of the bottom of our sphere geometry and reference back to our center point for setting our pivot. 
So I'm going to right click on the output of delete center point and I'm going to type transform and enter to accept that, enter to place that into the network. I'm going to rename this to special rotate underscore x form. So we can see we want to be rotating around Z, but we need to set our pivot point to be equal to that center point. And to do that, we're going to set pivot in X, Y, and Z to reference that delete stop that we just created to isolate that center point. And that's really nice and easy. I'm going to bring up the expression editor with Alt E on pivot X of our special rotate so that we can see the uh, expression we're going to use. And that's going to be the point expression. The point expression takes in a few parameters. The first is the SOP node that we wish to refer to. And that SOP node, we can see it's going to be our isolate center point because that's where the point is that we want to reference the information from. So I'm going to jump up a level and grab isolate center point. The next piece of information is our point number. Now, if we bring our view down to isolate center point, and bring up point numbers, we can see since we only have that one point, we only have point zero. And it doesn't matter what we're going to do with our sphere, if we were to change our sphere geometry at all, as long as we only have that one center point in that group, this guy will always be point zero. So we can reference point zero as our point. Let's move that so we can see. The next piece of information is the attribute that we actually wish to reference. And we want to grab the position attribute since we want to use the position of that point as our pivot. So that is a string that we need to pass. And that string is a capital P. And since it's a string, we put it in quote marks. So the position is the attribute. And since the attribute is a vector, we have to specify the index in that vector, 0 being x, 1 being y, and 2 being z. In this case, we're setting our pivot in x. So our pivot in x needs to rep uh, reflect the position in x of that point, and the position in x is index 0. So with that, we can accept out that expression. And that's going to set our pivot in x. We can already see that, that our pivot in x now matches our center point. So let's do the same for y and z. I'm going to right click on the expression that we just created and copy the parameter. I'm then going to right click on pivot y and paste copied expression so that we paste the expression into y and into z. I'm going to single left click on y and bring up the expression editor with Alt E. Now we're dealing with y, we need to grab index 1, the y coordinate of the position. So I changed the index, the last argument, into the point expression to 1 and accept. And you can see now we've snapped up in Y. Likewise, when dealing with Z, so I'm on pivot Z, Alt X, to, uh, sorry, Alt E to bring up the expression editor. And when dealing with Z, we want index 2, the Z coordinate of that point. And now we accept and we can see that I put a space in the expression, everything exploded. Let's delete out and enter. Fantastic. So we can see now that we have our geometry and our pivot is centered up on the geometry. So if we were to rotate in Z, we rotate about that pivot point. Which is exactly what we need. Exactly. And if we were to come back up and change our squash and stretch, say, squash this guy down, something like that. And I will pull right back on the bend because that's kind of extreme something like that we come back down again we're now still centered on the geometry which means it doesn't matter how we deform our sphere with these two um, deformations we can still rotate to do that flip based on the center point exactly okay that's pretty much all we wanted to accomplish in this video in the next video we'll go ahead and turn our character into a digital asset and set up and promote all parameters necessary. So basically we'll finish off our interface for the rig. Yeah. And with that, that is going to wrap up this video. Thanks a lot.